the Cotswold village of Burford in Oxfordshire. Every year, hundreds of people gather here for what they call Leveller's Day. The procession through the streets is colourful and light-hearted. But their main reason for being here is very serious. They're heading towards the church for a rather solemn occasion. It does give me great pleasure to uh, welcome you to Burford Church and to the churchyard uh, for the annual Leveller's Day ceremony. They come here to commemorate a bloody event that took place more than 350 years ago and to honour a group of people, the Levellers, who were imprisoned and executed here. Inside the church there are graphic reminders of the Levellers' presence. One of the prisoners, Anthony Sedley, carved his name on the font. But the Levellers are remembered for more important reasons than that. What happened in Burford Church so long ago? It is the 17th of May, 1649, and the country is just emerging from a long and bitter civil war between Parliament and King Charles I. These men, almost 400 of them, are prisoners in Burford Church. They're soldiers from the winning side, the victorious parliamentary forces of the new model army. But they've just taken part in a mutiny against their own officers. Until a few hours ago, they were all under threat of execution. But now they've been told that only the ringleaders will be punished. Cromwell and his men attacked us three nights ago. Took us completely by surprise. Yeah. We thought they were miles away in London, but they got here somehow or other. Some of the lads were still up. They were talking and drinking in the taverns, but the rest of us were in bed. We didn't stand a chance. The rebel soldiers, who are mainly from cavalry troops, have been trying to join up with troops from other regiments in the south and midlands of England. There are more than a thousand of them gathered in Burford when Oliver Cromwell attacked. Those who didn't manage to escape were easily disarmed. What was the mutiny all about? Why were you disobeying orders? We have many grievances. Most of us haven't been paid for months. How are we going to feed our families? And worse than that, they want to send us off to fight a new war. In Ireland, what quarrel have we got with the Irish? We weren't willing to go. Outside in the churchyard, loyal soldiers of the new model army are getting ready for an execution. They're preparing to shoot four of the leading mutineers. Cornet Thompson, Private Church, Corporal Perkins, and Chaplain Henry Den. Supervising proceedings is the commander of the new model army, General Sir Thomas Fairfax, who's led the parliamentary armies throughout the Civil War. But the real power is now in the hands of his second in command, Lieutenant General Oliver Cromwell. And it's Cromwell who the prisoners feel particularly bitter towards. And though they are relieved they are not going to be executed, they are angry about what has happened to them. They feel that Cromwell has betrayed them. Cromwell has not kept faith with us. We thought we were all on the same side. He kept telling us that he wanted the same things as we do. But it was all just words. Things were very different a few short months ago when we were fighting side by side against the king. Cromwell was proud of the new model army. In fact, he was a leading supporter of the whole idea. Until it was formed, Parliament's army was poorly led by lords and gentlemen. But Cromwell promoted ordinary men who were good soldiers and committed to our cause. He made us a tough, disciplined force. I look for religious men to join my command. Men who act out of principle and conscience and fear no one but God. I would rather have a plain, red-coated captain who knows what he fights for and loves what he knows than anyone who is called a gentleman. That is nothing else. The Lieutenant General is a deeply religious man. He's always praying and calling on God to be with him. 
He told us many times that we in the new model had been chosen by God to fulfill his purposes. The Lord has shaped this army into a mighty battle axe to do his will. We can be assured of victory. Well, he got his victory, but he hasn't kept faith with us. Our demands are reasonable, but we're being treated like common criminals. Soldiers always have complaints about their conditions, but there is much more to this mutiny than simply the grievances of the troops. At the heart of the Burford affair is a major disagreement between Cromwell and the prisoners over the future of the country. Many of these soldiers are levelers. They belong to a political movement which is fighting for greater rights and freedom for ordinary people. They're wearing sea green ribbons, the colours of their movement. Their ideas are set out in the pamphlet they're all discussing, an agreement of the people. Why are you called levellers? We didn't choose the name. It's what our enemies call us. They say we want to level out the differences between people to take property and wealth from the rich and give it to the poor. But they're just saying that to make people afraid of us. What we want is a new kind of government in this country, one that looks after the rights and interests of all the people, not just a few. That's why we mutinied. We've been trying to persuade Clonwell to act on the agreement of the people. But there's no hope of that now. They have smashed our movement. We're ruined. 75 miles away, under lock and key in the Tower of London, is John Lilburn, the civilian leader of the Levellers. Lilburn is anxiously awaiting news from Burford. He still doesn't know whether the Leveller Rebellion has been successful. Freeborn John, as he's known, is famous for his radical views about religious and political freedom. His books and pamphlets have had a huge influence on the soldiers of the new model army. Mr. Lilburn, why are you imprisoned here? I wrote a pamphlet criticising Cromwell and the other army leaders. It seems they didn't like it. But did you break the law? No. I am a free man, a free-born citizen of England. I have risked my life on the battlefield to fight for what I believe in. This is tyranny, as bad as anything King Charles ever did. In the early days of the Civil War, Lilburn fought as a captain in the Parliamentary Army. But gradually he became convinced that Parliament itself needed to be reformed and become more democratic. He left the army and began to campaign for his political ideas. Parliament as it now is represents only the rich, because only those with land and property are entitled to vote. This is not just. I believe that the poorest man in the land has as much right to a vote as the richest and the greatest. Through his writings, Lilburn's ideas spread like wildfire in the army and by 1647, a radical political movement was making its presence felt. Its manifesto was the agreement of the people, which in plain English, set out the levellers' proposals. The leaders of the parliamentary forces were compelled to take notice, and so two years before the Burford mutiny, Cromwell debated the agreement of the people with the leveller representatives in the army. But he took part mainly because he wanted to keep the soldiers united in the battle against the king. Even at this stage, he and his colleagues couldn't accept the leveller's radical ideas for widening democracy. No person has a right to a vote or a say in the way they are governed unless he has property, a permanent fixed interest in the kingdom. Our constitution has determined that only those who own land and property shall have a say in election. Then the constitution needs to change. We have been slaves, but now we demand our freedom. Yes. Every man in England has the right to elect his representative in Parliament. Aye. All government must be on the basis of the consent of the people. Aye. And this is what the political disagreement between Cromwell and the Levellers has finally led to. A failed mutiny and an execution in Burford Churchyard. The prisoners are making their final journey. Cromwell wants to make an example of them 
and so the rest of the rebellious soldiers are being forced to witness the proceedings from the church roof. The condemned men have all been promised a pardon if they will apologize and abandon their cause. Three have refused, but Chaplain Henry Den has gratefully accepted. The levellers say they simply want to reform Parliament and create a better government. I know Lilburn and his friends. Believe me, they would rather have no government at all in this kingdom. They are for anarchy and confusion. We must break them or they will break us. In the Tower of London, John Lilburn is receiving an unwelcome guest. Hugh Peter, a great friend of Oliver Cromwell's, has come to gloat over the failure of the leveller mutiny in Burford. John, my old friend, this is all for the good. Cromwell's won a great victory over anarchy and confusion. But I have never been in favour of anarchy. My principles have always shown that I am for liberty and property. I want to establish good laws and good government to safeguard those freedoms which belong to all of us as sons and daughters of God. And what better government can there be than for good people, nay, godly people, as our great leaders in the army? God has put the sword in their hands, he has given them this land, and we should rejoice. This is no cause for rejoicing. They now have unbridled power. I would rather live under very harsh laws, where at least I know what the rules are, than be governed by moderate and godly people who change the rules to suit themselves. The firing squad is ready. Surely I'll fire up. It's just four short months since another, even more dramatic execution. In January 1649, Charles I was beheaded by order of the parliamentary leaders. When King Charles was still alive and waging war, we were of use to the Lieutenant General. Cromwell needed us then, and so he played with us, debating the agreement of the people and discussing a new constitution. But it was all just words. But now he doesn't need us anymore. He can get rid of our poor friends just like he got rid of the king. I have no choice. These are dangerous and masterless men who will turn the world upside down if we let them. I have no other way to deal with them than to smash them. Cornet Thompson, Private Church and Corporal Perkins were executed in Burford Churchyard for promoting democratic ideas about government that today are taken for granted. But the democratic principle of one man, one vote wasn't enshrined in British law for another 200 years. Women weren't given the vote until well into the 20th century. Whatever happens to me and my good level of friends, generations to come will reap the benefit of our endeavours. <laughs>